Good afternoon. It is a privilege to be able to introduce to you today Ambassador David Rawson. Uh, before I introduce him, however, I would like to express a special thanks to Kim Fielding and Angela Wan for their tireless efforts to put together an outstanding International Week. In case uh, any of you here uh, have not gotten emails or seen the announcements for International Week, there's a cultural extravaganza tonight uh, to make you aware of. And also uh, this Friday, if you'd like to sign up for the Food Fiesta, apparently you can do that online. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask uh, uh, Angela or uh, Kim about that. I'd also like to, in addition to thanking the International Law Society, uh, I'd like to thank uh, David Cook and the Black Law Students Association. David, uh, thank you for your organization, organization support today. And also special thanks to uh, Robin Kirk and the Duke Human Rights Initiative for their support. All these individuals and groups have come together to sponsor this event today, and I thank you. Ambassador Ross and I met six years ago, 1999 to be exact, in Spring Arbor, Michigan. This was the same year he retired as Ambassador Republic of Mali, a post he held from 96 to 99. Ambassador Rawson and his spouse Sandra had returned from Africa to their family farm in Rollin, Michigan, and he began to teach political economy and political science at Spring Arbor University and Hillsdale College, positions he still holds. I'd grown up in Spring Arbor, Michigan, and of course was interested in international affairs, so when I heard an ambassador from, from Africa live nearby, I quickly made an effort to see him. After meeting with Ambassador Rawson, I learned that before joining the U.S. Foreign Service in 1971, he graduated from Malone College with a B.A. and from American University with an M.A. and Ph.D. Since 1971, he had served in Rwanda, Mali, Senegal, Madagascar, and Somalia, as well as various postings in the United States. He was and is a longtime student and practitioner of international affairs. Indeed, he served as chair of the United Nations Advisory Group on the West African Arms Moratorium, and he served as consultant to the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa. In addition to all of these accomplishments and interests, Ambassador Rawson also was appointed United States Ambassador to Rwanda at a time in history that would prove deadly. As the first United States observer to the new political talks between the acting Rwandan government and the rebel Rwandan Patriotic Front in 1993, Ambassador Rawson was hopeful that these talks and the Rusha peace accords which followed would bring an end to tension in Rwanda. He accepted his four-year ambassador, ambassador's appointment to Rwanda in 1993, and only a year later, in 1994, the president of Rwanda was murdered, setting off one of the most barbaric genocides our world has ever witnessed. Over 800,000 people were butchered, largely by machete, in just three months. Lately, the American public has been doing more soul searching on the tragedy of the Rwandan genocide. In addition to the movie Hotel Rwanda, there has been a spike in public research and reflection about what went wrong in 1994, why the United States and the international community did not respond to such a travesty sooner, and what to do now, diplomatically and legally, to avoid such a horrific genocide in the future. In response, Duke Law School has chosen to invite as a keynote speaker for this International Week one of the persons best qualified to address these difficult questions. It is with great anticipation, therefore, that I introduce to you a mentor and friend, Ambassador David Rawson. How's pizza? Are you getting enough to eat? Well, be thankful. Be thankful. Um, I want you to know right off the start that I'm not a lawyer or the son of a lawyer. In fact, I'm the son of a physician. Doing law in our home was simply not an option. Indeed, as my father used to tell the story, no, I think I better not go there. Um, telling lawyer jokes here is not probably the prudent thing to do. I'm outnumbered and Edmund Burke did say that prudence is the first law of politics, so uh, 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 we'll not get into that. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it is a, a, a difficult topic, and um, I do talk on this topic with some hesitancy. When asked to give his views on Hitler, Claude Lanzmann, the producer of Shoah, once re replied, any attempt to explain Hitler is obscene. 
because you are led, whether you want it or not, to justification. And an attempt to explain or to talk about genocide might also be seen as a, an attempt at justification. Not only that, but uh, Hannah Arendt has reminded us that attempts to define human nature itself almost inevitably end up with some construction of a deity. And I think a large degree of humility is in, in store as we look at these topics. But the genocide in Rwanda is not something that we can step aside and, and pass by on the other way from. We're reminded of the observation of Szesla Milos made in the context of the Holocaust. And it is an observation that's appropriate here. There is no such thing as an innocent bystander. If you are a bystander, you are not innocent. We are, I'm using a thing I've never used before, one of these little clickers. We'll hope that it uh, goes right. We are dealing with genocide, and we're looking at how before the genocide and with implications for after, during and after the genocide as well, the arts of diplomacy failed and failed miserably to, uh, to stop it. This is a street scene in Kigali. This is a church at Nyamata. It looked very much like that and the first time I visited it. You could literally walk from one end of the church on a couple feet of uh, littered bodies. Eventually the church was cleaned up. The skulls were put together in a memorial site and you can see on the tops of those skulls the slashes of the machete chops. Diplomatically, obviously, we look at genocide from a national perspective, that is Charles Muragandhi, the foreign minister of Rwanda. We look at it multinationally, that is a picture of the then president of Rwanda, Havyarimana, on the right, the president of Burundi in the middle, and the president of Uganda, Museveni, uh, on the left, talking to uh, Rose Havyarimana. And we look at it internationally. Now, we need to review just a little bit what diplom diplomacy is all about. What is the basis of diplomatic action? I'm honored to be here. I'm honored that, uh, for the career that I've had in the United States Foreign Service. But diplomats are really letter carriers between sovereigns. A diploma is a folded piece of paper, the kind of folded piece of paper that might have secret messages in it. And diploma, diplomats are, are, are letter carriers. One of my bosses, uh, Ambassador Hank Cohen, who later became Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, was the political counselor at the time of the Vietnam talks with Henry Kissinger uh, and the North Vietnamese in Paris. And I once remarked to him, that must be very, very exciting to be right there at the very edge of this great drama that was happening in the peace talks. And he said, you know, David, I'm just a post box. I get messages and I deliver messages. That's basically what I'm supposed to do. Now, um, the conduct of diplomacy is essentially the conduct of business between states by peaceful means, says Ernest Satow. Uh, Sir Satow wrote uh, the, one of the classic works on diplomacy. And... Uh, Sovereigns, since the Treaty of Westphalia, have lived within state boundaries, and within those state boundaries, they run the show. They are in charge. They make the rules. Moreover, sovereign states claiming to represent a nation, some nation, uh, in the form of the nation state, form the normative model of contemporary polity. Um, and these states are bound together in an international society. I take uh, Headley Bull's here, Anarchical Society. Uh, uh, in an international society based on mutual respect, mutuality, and respect of agreements, uh, reciprocity, uh, treaties, uh, conventions, and so forth. Um, the 
international society, in the international society, we treat all state agents as equal and give to each the respect of its political presence that its political presence demands, says Lang in his study. So we have this notion of equality, we have this notion of sovereignty, we have this notion of the, the nation state, and we also have, of course, the sense of uh, a political presence, that is, some are, everybody's equal, but some are more equal than others because of, of, their, of their political presence on the stage. The international society holds international peace and security as its highest norm, and that is, of course, in the, in, in the UN Charter, uh, what brings states there together and what makes states act together within uh, the UN context are, are threats to uh, international security and international uh, peace. And, and thus, diplomats have a real, a dual mission. They are charged to promote national security on the one hand and international peace on the other. As custodians uh, of the international order, diplomats are committed to certain modalities that make conversation, that make communication possible between states. Harold Nicholson, again a great commentator on, uh, on diplomacy, talks of the, the, the norms and values of moderation, of, of fair dealing, of, of reasonableness. And you have to have that if you are able to, going to be able to talk to each other uh, and to promote, uh, to promote, promote peace in the international arena. And amongst these modalities is, of course, the notion that uh, states should have relationships with each other, that these relationships ought to be durable and that they can be improved. And hence we get to the notion of perpetual negotiation, which Richelieu first talked about. Moreover, in, in this effort of perpetual negotiation between states, diplomats communicate in formats and with procedures that are now universally recognized and practiced. We all go to school to learn how to write first-person notes and third-person notes and, 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 and the kinds of phrasings and aid memoirs and uh, how to do resolutions in, uh, in international assemblies and so forth. Now, diplomacy then uh, becomes not uh, the formul formulation of policy, nor is it the interpretation of law, but again, using Nicholson, it is the art of negotiation. And that art of negotiation recognizes that both sides in any controversy have a point. You've got to assume that somebody is right on this side, some's got some good on this side, and somebody over here on this side's got some good. Um, and then that there is a middle ground in between that the, that the two sides can somehow agree on. I think you can begin to see how this isn't going to work in a genocidal situation, where as diplomats, your primary concern is looking for the middle ground, looking for the common ground, engaging both sides in, in negotiation. And as diplomats, we are obviously biased towards precision, it's not true that diplomats are sent out to lie for their country. Diplomats always tell the truth. They may not tell all of the truth, but they always tell at least some of the truth. Uh, towards precision, towards patience, and mainly towards persuasion. Convincing the other person to go along with your idea. With a goal of establishing understanding, says Nicholson again, between the states, and eventually on the basis of understanding some degree of amity, of friendship between states. There's a further complication. Traditionally, diplomacy was representatives of sovereigns going to a country talking to other representatives of sovereigns or talking to the sovereign himself, carrying messages back and forth, making their demarches and so forth, and what we call bilateral diplomacy. And in Rwanda, from the time of independence really, until, until about 1992, that was the way the United States, France, Great Britain, Tanzania, other neighboring African countries carried on their relationships with the Rwandan government. Uh, Ambassadors would, would 
get messages from their headquarters, would take those messages to the foreign ministry or uh, to uh, the presidency or maybe even to the president himself. There was a lot of coordination with other diplomats, particularly diplomats who came from the, the western donor states. Uh, and there was uh, sometimes joint demarches very carefully worked out with the headquarters in Belgium and Germany and, and uh, the United States uh, agreeing on texts that would then be communicated. Um, and there was, in a, in a little country like Rwanda, fairly frequent contact with the guy who was really in charge, which is the president. Uh, my predecessor, Ambassador Flatten, met with the president of Rwanda a lot. Um, sometimes informally, sometimes very formally, sometimes with stern messages, sometimes with, uh, with light messages. Uh, that changed just as in the international arena. The, we went from a, a, a period of bilateral diplomacy with the formulation of the League of Nations and later the United Nations where we began to do diplomacy around the table. And if you read those old manuals from Satow or Nicholson, you can find how disconcerted they are that they have now to deal with a diplomacy that is a conference diplomacy as opposed to a bilateral diplomacy. But in any case, that changed for Rwanda uh, from May 1992, where we began to move towards a ceasefire, established a ceasefire, and then went into political negotiations, not in Rwanda, um, but in Tanzania, in, in, at Arusha. And there we were I was the first U.S. observer at those negotiations. We were dealing in conference diplomacy. We were around a table. We observers were, were part of a, of a larger process. And uh, we were constrained in the things we could say and do by, by that very process of, of uh, getting agreement around the table, which was the whole point of the, of the political negotiations. It was a constrained environment, but it had a lot of independence of action in this particular because uh, we're pretty well cut off from the outside world. Uh, in those days, Arusha didn't have a telephone worth, worth a hoot. You could, you could dial for half an hour, an hour or so forth, before you even got a, a, an outside line. Uh, and so you're, you're kind of independent, and you kind of could be a cowboy and kind of do your own thing and, and talk to both sides and encourage them ahead and so forth. But nonetheless, it was a constrained environment, and, and the agreements that, were, that arrived at then did constrain the limits of what a diplomat could do. Um, the most important thing to understand about the Arusha peace talks as a process, however, is that there was a whole diplomatic thrust forward to a new vision of Rwanda happening there that was not happening back home in Kigali. And phones being what they were, a lot of times the, the negotiators there would, would make agreements without the leadership back in Kigali knowing about it. And sometimes they complained they couldn't get through on the phone when they probably could have gotten through on the phone. They just left the, the phone off the hook and went ahead and did their negotiations so that these Arusha agreements that were supposed to establish the basis on which Rwanda was going forward, would go forward were not generally accepted by a significant part of the, uh, of the political establishment back home. It was a parallel track. And then, beginning with the agreement, uh, signature of the agreement in August 93 until, um, really, until the end of the UN mission to Rwanda in, in February of 96, we have a different level of negotiation, one that was characteristic of the post-war, Second World War period, uh, as we got into the Marshall Plan, or as we got into other kinds of international governmental organizations, where there was a specific agenda, there was a specific target, there specific, specific goals, and, 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 the, and the arts and skills of diplomacy were not in, in relational kinds of exchanges, not in nuanced observ observations of what was going on, but in, in thrusting forward to the reestablishment of Europe or whatever it may be. And in this case, it was in implementing the Arusha Accords, um, and this was under UN jurisdiction. Case in point. The leadership from the United States, Belgium, and France at a time when the implementation process is blocked in Rwanda are sitting around talking about what could we do more that we haven't already done, and somebody raises a cautionary flag and said we shouldn't get out ahead of the United Nations. At one particular point, by this, by this time I had, uh, I had come in, in January, February, we were having some, some real difficulty, and it, and it looked like uh, the, the president's party was going to, to, to move ahead and establish a new government um, in a meeting that they were about to go into. 
I, at that time, I didn't have a chance to check with anybody. I just grabbed the phone and I called and, and got a hold of the president's legal advisor. And I said, look, the president is sworn in as the president of the, of the interim transition institutions under the Russia courts. If a government, any government other than that provided for in the Russia courts is established, it will be considered to be a coup against a legitimate, a legitimate government. And our Congress has very serious problems with coups against legitimate governments. Because I can't tell you what would happen, but I can warn you that you're going down the wrong road. Got a couple of presidential advisors, they carried the message, and then, but then, I had to call the Secretary General's special representative and tell him what I did. Ordinarily, as United States Ambassador, plenipotentiary, you know, that would have been it. But now I'm under a UN project, and I had to make sure that was communicated up and coordinated up. Um, I missed a slide. Well, there it is. Uh, this is the UN project, highly coordinated. We did things together in joint demarches, uh, very little initiative, uh, per room for personal initiative, goal-oriented, and uh, not very nuanced. Now, I want to go through the next thing rather quickly, and, and if you want to look at this more specifically, uh, I want, uh, you can take up Michael Lund's book, Preventing Violent Conflicts, a United States Institute of Peace uh, publication. He has at the back of that a toolbox in, in, in the conflict resolution. Everybody's talking about toolboxes, about diplomatic toolboxes used to prevent conflict of one kind or another. And he has probably the, the most thorough listing of um, of those, and so I've got a whole bunch of stuff here that you, I don't want you to focus on. I'm just going to make some specific comments about it. Um, that um, first of all, uh, the uh, use of armed force or the threat of the use of armed force was was not terribly uh, evident in uh, in the Rondon case, excepting in the early days when. Uh, uh, General uh, Marshal Mobutu sent over some Zairean troops to kind of help the Rwandans push back this insurgency that had come across the border in 1990. Um, very quickly, the Zairean troops did more damage, pillaging uh, and, and other kinds of uh, actions within Rwanda than they did in fighting the foe, and, and the Rwandans had to ask them to leave. So, but that was a, a little case of a, a, time, a, a, a effort to establish regional balance. Uh, restraints on the use of armed force, a whole list of things here. Um, the, uh, we did use confidence building measures. Uh, we had long, long arguments about demilitarized zones, how to police them uh, with the Organization of African Unity, with the UN or whoever. Um, we had arm, arms embargoes, especially after the genocide, there was an arms embargo and that became a problem once the Rwandan government had actually won the war. Um, we had military-to-military um, military, uh, training programs. Uh, we have, of course, if diplomatic measures. You see, you, you kind of you got kind of the armed forces measures, and then you have you have arm-twisting diplomatic measures, um, diplomatic sanctions. We didn't use. We did use economic sanctions of a sort in, in, in withholding assistance. IMF, um, uh, World Bank withheld assistance until the, the Rwandans would, is, would, would get together and establish the institutions. Um, moral sanctions, obviously there were strong condemnations. We did not have until um, long after the genocide had happened, that is October of 94, an international criminal tribunal for Rwanda. And so, uh, that, as a, as a tool, wasn't really available. Now we have the non-coercive. This is a, the, the diplomatic persuasion. There's a whole bunch of these. Um, obviously, we have international appeals. We have the president's uh, spokesman appealing. We have the State Department spokesman appealing. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, track tube diplomacy. We had third-party consultations. We used most of the tools that were in this uh, had fact-finding missions, human rights fact-finding missions. Um, we had uh, commissions of inquiry. Uh, 
all kinds of commissions of inquiry. We had at least three major international commissions looking at whether or not genocide actually happened, uh, which is one of the reasons it took so long to decide that genocide did indeed happen. Um, For those of you who are lawyers, you'd be interested to know that um, there was uh, no arbitration, there was no adjudication, uh, and as I said, uh, we didn't have an international criminal tool in the box at that point in time. Um, any of you that have seen the film uh, uh, Hotel Rwanda remember a scene, however, in which uh, <coughs> the Rwandan general is threatened that uh, if he doesn't uh, protect the people who are in, in the hotel, that he will be held personally uh, responsible. Uh, and that is, in fact, a threat uh, under, under basis of the Geneva Conventions, the Common Article 3 and the Additional Protocol Number 2, uh, which basically is telling him, as an actor here, you cannot be hide behind the fact that you are a general of some army that claims to be the Army of Rwanda. You are a person, and you are personally liable for whatever happens to these people that are in the hotel. That was a threat, in fact, that was given by Prudence Bushnell, our, our Deputy Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, long before we had any strategy about setting up an international tribunal. It might have even been a bluff, but it was the best she could do was to, to, to roll out this threat of personal liability for the people that were under his protection. Now, uh, development governance approaches, just to mention that, that these kinds of things are basically related to the, the dependency kind of syndrome we have between the donor states and the, and the recipient states in, in third world things, where we try to use uh, economic uh, pressure of one kind or another uh, to, uh, to, to, to bring about political performance or political conformity. Um, let me just say it doesn't work. Before I went out as ambassador to Rwanda, I, I worked to pull together a very, very impressive portfolio of new kinds of things we would put uh, on the table as soon as there was a, a government established in Kigali. And it didn't move anybody. I, I, in some of the research I'm doing, I'm rereading re some of the stuff I wrote then, and one, one, one phrase I thought was particularly felicitous, excuse me, but I, I, rereading I thought it was pretty good. I said, we have stuck the economic dagger to the, to the hilt and we have yet to draw blood. Don't you like that? Uh, and it's true. You know, we threatened them that, you know, they're going to lose and they're going to lose and their millions of dollars were at stake and it didn't move them a bit because they saw their own personal security or their own political power at stake. Um, in, the, in the political approaches, uh, the... Uh, Enforcement of human rights, democratic and other standards, uh, either has to be through some kind of conditionality um, on assistance programs, or uh, it has to be through some kind of an in international instrument, uh, an international force that is there to, to make this happen. Uh, and we really don't have that possibility for, for real enforcement of, of human rights in an international context. Uh, conventions on human behavior, the, the Genocide Convention, the, the Geneva Conventions, um, the Common Article 3, Additional Protocol 2, these are all very, very important out there as benchmarks uh, against which uh, uh, states and persons can now be judged. Um, elections and election monitoring seems to be one of the things that we, we're most in favor of, and, and there's some good reasons for that. Um, uh, we, we really do an awful lot of that around the world. And, and military to military consultations, there's an infamous um, uh, program put on in, in Burundi, in Bujumbura, for uh, military officers of the region, and it included uh, the top military officers from Burundi and the top military officers from Rwanda. Um, and this was June, July, maybe, of, uh, of 1993. Um, and uh, Bill Foltz, who was the, then the um, uh, National Intelligence Officer for, for the United States government, uh, led that. He was an African expert. He led that seminar. And everybody was thrilled about this new insight of how to do military stuff democratically, how to respect other people. And everybody thought this was the most wonderful thing that ever happened, excepting that some of those same military officers in October went and assassinated the democratic elected president of Burundi. 
and others of those military officers launched the genocide in Rwanda in, in April of, of, of 94. It makes you wonder about the whole process of education. Um, just a quick word on, on uh, uh, governance structures. Uh, if you look at this, uh, uh, trusteeship, it seems to me, was the kind of thing that ought to have been asserted about the time we, we started getting into, into genocide. Probably that's because I did my doctoral dissertation on trusteeship. Uh, nobody wants to hear about trusteeship anymore. Many people have suggested in the context of Rwanda partition. Why don't we have the Cyprus approach and just move the Tutsis up here and the Hutus there? The only people that don't understand that are the Rwandans because they have always lived together and they can't even imagine what Rwanda would be as a partition country. Um, obviously too small for federation or confederation. Um, some kind of power sharing or consociation. When I was the U.S. observer, I suggested to them, given the fact that there were different regional interests and there were different political interests and that you also had the, the kind of the social caste Tutsi, Tutsi, Tutsi Hutu thing, uh, that uh, some sort of, 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 of Dutch or, or Swiss approach consociation, and I lent them the, readings of the writings of Aaron Lippart uh, on this subject. And about a week later, the two sides were quoting from Aaron Lippart against each other. And uh, so it, it, they didn't buy into that. Now, so we used an incredible number of the tools that were in the toolbox, and still we failed. Why did we fail? Perhaps we were too naive. Um, Cyrus Schatz, a distinguished Africanist, talking about Nigeria, um, talked in, in the early 60s, talked about uh, naive policy optimism. Uh, policymakers tend to be cockeyed optimists. Uh, that's what policy is all about, looking for a better world. And uh, we were naive about the African society capacity to survive, and, and we'd had a lot of coups in Africa, and, and you know, they kind of shake it off and they, they go on their way. Um, uh, and, and in this case, uh, uh, the society was, was ripped in two. Uh, we were naive about the nature of African wars. I can remember one of the wars in, uh, in, in Liberia. I was on the, uh, I was on the, uh, the watch desk um, as the reports were coming in from the field. And one of the reports says there's an awful lot of shooting but not much fighting going on. Uh, and this is kind of our picture of, of African, you know, shooting in the air and trying to scare each other with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with gunfire. And here we had a very different picture where people went after each other and, uh, with, with machetes. Um, we were obviously naive about our ability through persuasion to move the country towards peace. We had miscalculations about force. We should have had a bigger UN force. We should have had a more robust UN force than we did. Um, uh, one of the tools whereby they, uh, that they were working with was to work with the gendarmerie, and, and, and that didn't work. Um, we underestimated, finally, the will to power. I understand some of you are, are going to have to go on to another class. I do want to offer a little bit of time for questions, so I'm going to hurry along here. The things that we're up against is the fact that all throughout, we still consider the state, even the state, as, as totally torn apart as Rwanda was to be sovereign. Um, we had... Um, uh, problems in, uh, with our modes of diplomatic discourse, we're still kind of talking the, the nice persuasive language when we should have really gotten tough. The commitment to negotiation until the very last day of the war, pressures from the United States, from France, Great, from Great Britain, from, uh, from Belgium, on the two Rwandan sides were for, for compromise, for negotiation, for ceasefire in the middle of genocide. And when you look back at that, you say, what, you know, there wasn't any other side at that point in time. Somebody needed to intervene and to stop this thing from happening. A ceasefire didn't make any sense at all. Um, but that's what diplomacy is all about. And of course, we, in, in a bilateral sense, there are a lot of blinders on, uh, relationships with the presidents, a, a commitment to the, to the existing government uh, in the, uh, in the conference, there were a lot of things happening at the conference that weren't really understood back home. 
um, and you could almost call them capers if you want. And, and finally, uh, the international, working in the international system brought about gridlock. So I conclude that um, our problems with diplomacy is that um, we are controlled by state interpretations. We tend to play to other states worrying about what other states are thinking than worrying about the people who are suffering. Uh, we tend to push our own history and our own ethic on the international stage. We're more f interested in saving states than we are in saving people. And our dominant diplomatic ethos is about negotiation, fair play, and power sharing. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes we need political will. And political will comes from two places. One is the people and the other is the president. And that's what we didn't have in the case of Rwanda. One thing we do know a lot about in, in, in diplomacy is precedence. We all line up against uh, by who, whoever got to be sworn as, in, as ambassador first. Famous conference, uh, Congress of Vienna, where they, they cut, uh, they had a, a, a conference hall built with doors so each chief of state could enter at the same time uh, and so forth. We know precedence and I think what we need to really take seriously is that people must take precedence. That's my remarks. I'd be open to questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have a question. On one of your slides, you said something about, um, I guess it was too much optimism about uh, African societies not being able to survive. My thought is perhaps a lot of the conflict comes from outsiders, including Americans, um, since, like you said, the focus is on saving the countries perhaps for their resources and not the people. So maybe other people bring those conflicts in. So what do you mean by Africans not being able to survive? I'm talking They've been surviving. Yeah, well, they, yeah and that's why I'm saying that in, in most cases, African societies have been tremendous survivors of famine, of, 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 of all kinds of political difficulties. But in the case of Rwanda, it didn't happen that way. Uh, the, survive, the society did not survive. It went berserk instead. Perhaps because of the outside. That was one of the factors. Yes, sir. I was going to say, you said that I, maybe a UNME, or the UN needed a much larger force. Um, but would you agree that perhaps they actually needed the uh, authority to use force rather than actually? Yeah, they needed. Um, they needed what we call Chapter 7 rather than Chapter 6 uh, authority. But there was a problem, even with Chapter 6, they had initially authority to protect themselves and to protect innocent people. And that the rules of engagement were progressively drawn down in the interest of the political dialogue that was going on, the diplomatic thing, were progressively drawn down so that by the time the, the President plane was shot down, uh, the rules of engagement forced Belgian paratroopers to give up their arms instead of going to save the, 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 the Prime Minister of Rwanda. And those paratroopers were, were cut in pieces. Um, and so uh, a full-fledged Chapter 6 might have worked, but they really did need Chapter 7. Uh, I called the State Department by phone that night when I heard the President's plane going down. I said, These, they're going to have to have a new mandate and they're going to have to have more equipment if the UN is going to hold. Um, I perhaps again, perhaps na naively thought that this was something that some could be worked out at the UN level, but it is a, 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 an intergovernmental organization. And, and it was, uh, you know, it took us months of wrangling before we even got close to having the size of force. And the main thing was we didn't have the robustness of force. General Dallaire wanted to have a, a ready reaction force with armored, uh, with helicopters in reserve, and he didn't have that. Um, and, uh, and the rest is a disaster. Yes, sir. What would you personally have done different if you had the benefit of hindsight? Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's kind of two stages there. One is the time when I'm, well, well there's three stages. One is when I'm the U.S. observer uh, to, as the Russia process. And it became quite clear that neither the Rwandan government made up of various political parties nor the RPF wanted to have anything to do with elections. They didn't want to test their mandate. That's the point where I think we should have pushed them hard to get some kind of a test of whether the agreement they had come up with really was accepted by the Rwandan people. Um, we didn't. 
Uh, we, we let them come up with their own formulation, which, which was essentially that each of the political parties, however formed, would, would be the one that chose the representatives of the National Assembly and the representatives of government. And then when it came to do that, the parties fell apart and we didn't have any. So that was one. Um, in the period coming up to the, to the time the President's plane was, was, one of the big issues was inclusiveness. The U.S. policy is inclusiveness. Everybody should be in the political formula, otherwise they're going to be spoilers on the outside. There was an extremist Hutu group that we were arguing, so long as they would disavow their extremism, commit themselves to peace, ought to be at least given one seat in the National Assembly. The Rwandan Patriotic Front wouldn't hear about that. And there was a tremendous uh, diplomatic push to, to make that happen, to make that precise thing happen, including almost a, a, a kind of a do it or else kind of thing, which was uh, perhaps uh, uh, we should have let the Rwandans at that point argue this out amongst themselves rather than, than trying to push the will of the combined international community on that particular point. I think that, that's an essential one. After the plane went down and after we had evacuated, I was evacuated back to Washington where I was, nothing is more, more enlightening than for Ambassador to come back to Washington and, and find out what a small cog he is in the wheel. Um, what really was needed very early on at this point was presidential determination that we're gonna do something and we're gonna do it fast. And we never ever got that. I had been invited to the White House by the President on the telephone once I got back his staff got in the way, and I never got a chance to see the president and talk to him about what was happening there. And uh, that's what we really needed was, a, was uh, the president to, to take the leadership on this, and, and the rest of the bureaucracy would have followed. Okay, yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I don't know if you agree, but I, I think what we can see is a bit of schizophrenia when it comes to the U.S. dealing with human rights issue. When it chooses to protect human rights in other states, as opposed to when it chooses to respect state sovereignty. In light of the Rwandan crisis, I was wondering whether the new approach that the current administration and even the Clinton post-Rwanda administration seem to have with intervening when gross human rights abuses are at stake. We saw that in the case of Bosnia. We see that now in the case of Iraq. Is there a way that you can explain that shift? Is it that as a result of lessons in Rwanda, or are there other variables and other factors at play that you might be able yeah. to talk a little bit more. Um, the, the, interest, the, the examples you give are interesting ones, though I think we have to come to Darfur to get something that, that's parallel to the Rwandan situation. Uh, and there, the traditional formulation of U.S. foreign policy is African solutions for African problems. So we have pushed forward African troops and um, in, 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 in funded African troops and tried to help African troops in the Darfur situation. Uh, we have not wanted to got, get directly involved ourselves as we have in Bosnia, for example, uh, and, and as, as we have in Iraq. Uh, we did proclaim the, the Darfur situation to be a genocidal situation, but as Samantha Power, who wrote the book on the, on the thing, says it's not what you say, it's what you do. Um, and uh, we have made some success in Darfur, but has not near, been nearly as rapid as it should be. Um, Personally, I think we, we do not yet have something that we need, and that is kind of a, a tripwire mechanism, just as we have for, for disasters. How long did it take for us to get on the ground in, in, between Pakistan and India in the last earthquake? We were there in 24 hours. American people care about human suffering. We really do. But when it comes to international political kinds of things, when it comes to human rights kinds of things, all of a sudden we're into this, you know, well, the state's got a right to do whatever and, and the state sovereignty thing hits us in the head. We need to have a tripwire mechanism that if we see levels of, of human suffering, if people really do take precedence, if we begin to see levels of human suffering uh, on the international scene, that uh, a whole series of, of procedural me me measures will, will, will go into place that will not necessarily have American troops on the ground, but will have Americans pushing forward very vigorously in the UN for some kind of UN or some kind of regional force that will stop people from doing dastardly things to other people. And uh, we, we don't have that kind of, we, we can respond to natural disasters, but we cannot respond to human rights disasters yet in an effective way. Yes, sir. So, I the only solid argument I've heard in response to the United States not um, looking at genocide as a trigger to send immediate massive military force to an area is because of the potential consequences afterwards. Do you think that um, there's that overwhelming that sending a military presence from the United States independently of the United Nations, the political consequences in the area and outside would be too great to prevent genocide? 
Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. I was asked to speak at, up in Boston uh, to uh, a, a group of people that were pretty well opposed to where, we, that was before we got into the Iraq war, but they were opposed to us going there, it was quite clear. And, and initially they said to me, why don't you come up, because they wanted to, me to talk about Rwanda, but they wanted to have a full house. And so say, we'll, we'll peg this as a comparison of Iraq and Rwanda. And then they called me back and they said, well, we're not really sure that's such a good idea, because if you look at this kind of comparison, what we had was, was a preemption in Iraq. What many people on, Rwanda said, on, on, on the Rwanda genocide said we should have preempted. Or uh, we have unilateralism in Iraq, uh, which many people oppose, and that's precisely what most of the people said we should have done in, 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 in Rwanda. So it is a dilemma. Um, let me just cite the French Operation Turquoise. The French saved thousands of lives in the Operation Turquoise in the western part of Rwanda. Um, but they had, there, was, there was political ramifications to what was more or less, it had UN sanction, but very, very light UN sanction, a unilateral French uh, presence in, in this. They were the only ones that did anything, by the way. We, we, we basically did not do anything other than, than, than talk. Uh, but um, uh, they have, they have the, the relationship between France and Rwanda has been soured ever since, and they're still dealing with, with the, the, the political effects. Now, I think a, a middle-sized power like France is more likely to get caught in that kind of a jam than a, than a major power like the United States. But I think in many places, having American troops on the ground is, is not what we need. We need probably Canadian troops, Australian troops, other kinds of troops on the ground. But American taking the lead in making this happen in, in, a, in, a, in a very rapid, programmable kind of way. Because if, you know, you send in your investigating missions, the, 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 the three experts, the, the special rapporteur, the, um, there were actually two special rapporteurs that went in. The human rights uh, uh, commissioner all went to Rwanda and, and made their reports. And then what? You know, um, genocide was happening. And then by the time genocide was over, they're, they're making the reports, did it really happen or not? And, and, and by international law, we don't know if genocide happened in Rwanda until we come to the case of, of Prosper against Akayezu uh, in the International Tribunal. And then they had to spend about six months trying to figure out if this was, in fact, genocide or some other kind of killing. Uh, that's ridiculous. I mean, when you have the kind of, of carnage that we see going on around it, it's clearly we've got to do something. It's clear we've got to do something. Questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, can you detail more what you mean by why we shouldn't send U.S. troops in, but why we should send, say, British, Canadian, Australia, you know, Commonwealth troops in? Um, number one, we are the world's number one major power. Sure. Uh, and wherever we go, that has tremendous political ramifications. Um, a lot of police people really don't want to see the United States coming in, so some places they do. Um, number two, I think the deployment of, Afri of American troops in Africa is highly problematic. We've, we've never really done it um, for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in a situation like Rwanda, for example, where you had uh, a, a convoluted um, uh, social conflict, uh, putting American troops into that kind of thing, uh, you end up being on one side or the other, and are you on the right side or not? In the case, once the genocide happened, it wasn't, was, that was pretty clear, but before, I'm talking about preemption. Uh, so I think the deployment of American troops in, in, uh, in Africa um, unilaterally is, is, is highly problematic, and uh, we probably need the, the wisdom of, of a, uh, our peers, the wisdom of, a, of, a, of a others in the international community in, in dealing with African issues. Not to mention the fact that uh, all the way back to Sophie Williams, by the way, who was a Michigan, Michigander, our first, our second Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Um, Sophie Williams formulated the idea of African solutions to African problems in 1960. And that's basically the one, the, the, that's been our mantra. We hum this every morning when we go in the State Department. Um, you know, uh, so. Yes, sir. What would be the threshold for this humanitarian doctrine of our justification of military rational, or I guess what set of factors would you consider? And if multilateralism is the way to go, what uh, international organization do you see uh, fitting? I mean, it, it, would the UN be appropriate, or another organization like NATO or OSCE be a better yeah, uh, platform? Yeah, yeah. Really, of really good questions. Um, and, 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 and the first question you ask goes back to what makes genocide genocide? How groupy does it have to be? If you look at the U.S. reservations, uh, as we signed the Genocide Convention, we said, yeah, okay, we, we, genocide, but genocide has to be really big. 
before genocide. And, and you know, I had a political officer who um, was a good writer, and he, he had a felicitous phrase. He said, genocide begins one murder at a time. Wrong. Genocide begins only when you have a big group of people being taken out, and, and, and there's big debate as to how big that group needs to be. Um, but uh, I, think, I think if we get away from, you know, the genocide convention per se, uh, or, 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 you know, violation of human rights on the other side, and there's a contest in that in, in international law as to which way we ought to go, and, and, and look at atrocities. If atrocities are being committed by a state against its own people in a significant way, and it's pretty hard to say 10 or 15 or whatever, um, then, then we ought to begin to organize ourselves internationally and very quickly. The, the thing is to have, have those communications already established. I'm not talking about a standing armed force, I'm talking about having a set of procedures uh, in place that, would, that would, would gear up armed forces that were known to be, to be available. And often this would, depending on where you are, I mean, Ted Gurr looks around the world and finds uh, uh, 256 different minority groups at risk right now. You know, which ones of these are going to be at the point where we have to intervene? Uh, the UN can't do it all. The United States can't do it all. You're going to have to depend on regional configurations of some kind or other. And I think the thing to do would, was to work towards a kind of a, um, a regionalization of responsibility. The, re, the responsibility to protect, which was a, a study done by, uh, by the Canadian, with sponsorship of the Canadian government, but an international study, um, that in, in situations like this, we, international community, we, states of the world, we, people of the world, do have a responsibility to protect. I think we need to move forward on that agenda. All right? Yes, sir. I was going to say, uh, on the kind of naivety issue, if you look over the last, say, 50 years, and you see that America's kind of premise has been kind of the use of force in solving these, these uh, humanitarian, perceived humanitarian issues. Um, now, do you see, do you seem that or do you believe that there are any alternatives with regards to um, the use of force? Um, because, I mean, like, I mean, instead of hard power, are there any soft power options besides the United Nations, considering that, you know, the United Nations isn't really empowered by the United States, even though they do believe that they could be the answer to the problem? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, again, and, uh, Having experienced uh, a UN working in the context of a of a UN operation where we had a UN force, a UN force commander, and by the way, General Dallaire, I think, is one of the bravest men I know. Um, a lot of times, having a UN operation only compounds the situation. Um, so, um, absent moving in the troops, well, you go back to that toolbox, there's a whole series of things in that toolbox that could probably be pushed forward more effectively uh, on the persuasive side of the house. Um, uh, and if you can get a constellation of people agreeing uh, about some of these things, uh, you, you might be able to forestall um, very real. Uh, we, we do have the fact that, you know, the genocide did erupt almost immediately after the President's plane went down. Uh, we had uh, killing on, on hills very near our house of, 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 of militia or soldiers or whoever they were going through houses and, and shooting innocent people. Uh, we, had, uh, we had some 300 people gathered in our compound and, and, and somebody got up on a tree so they could shoot down in the compound and they killed a child and, and wounded two women in, amongst innocent refugees. Uh, and that was only the, only the beginning. And so bad things were happening in Kigali like on day one. Um, especially the rounding up of the political opposition, and like the prime minister and murdering her in, in cold blood in front of her children and so forth. But um, that possibly could have been contained, you know, if, if uh, we'd, we had worked quickly enough, you know. And, and, and the fact that the answer was take all the expatriates out only opened the door. Um, keeping an expatriate presence in a, in a genocidal situation may, may be at least part of the solution, even if it's non-governmental. And this is going to take a little bit of bravery. Uh, the only really brave people in this story was one Adv Adventist guy who stayed to help protect the children under his care, and the International Commission of the Red Cross, the, the Swiss people who stayed all throughout this, all, all these horrors. 
um, and, and we're the international presence and the international witness. It, it was the ICRC who told us the numbers, and we knew those numbers as of, you know, within a week of, of, of the plane going down, the size of what was happening there. Saying that we didn't know is, is, doesn't fly. We, we had the numbers. We knew what was happening in Rwanda. A question on that point. Um, <coughs> if there's one thing that's clear from a lot of what's been written afterwards about about Rwanda, is that um, there was a lot of information months before the plane went down that indicated that this was not this was not an emotional response by the Hutu to the plane crash. This was something that had been very painstakingly prepared. As early as January of 1994, the famous memo from Dallaire to the UN asking uh, if he could have the power to make a raid to grab some of the weapons that they were stockpiling. Um, I, I just have two questions. One is, um, um, do, do you agree with that? I mean, was there information that you felt was credible that you had? I mean, I, I guess I'm wondering about this idea of being naive. Because what comes out of a lot of the writing about this is that it, it wasn't naivete. It was uh, knowing <coughs> and not either having the political will or the political backing or the political space to do anything. And I'm yeah. just wondering uh, how you respond to that. And then um, I just wanted to know if you could comment. I, I, as I understand it, you, you did evacuate with the US Embassy staff, mm -hmm. but the Rwandan staff was left behind. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know um, how many of them survived. To answer your last question, of about 150 people, we lost 30 people. Um, very, very sad going back into that situation. One of the most moving times when we had a memorial service um, for those on both sides that were lost. And um, uh, we had little Rwandan girls dancing uh, before the altar. Um, that didn't bring you to tears, nothing would. You know. um, the, People were basically hunkered down. Uh, there wasn't, uh, the people weren't around the embassy uh, when we, when, by the time we got out. Um, uh, in any case, uh, some of the cars were searched and if there had been Rondons in, they would have been taken out and probably, they probably safer not trying to get out with us if they were Rondons. But all that doesn't really excuse the fact that uh, we left them behind to whatever happened to them, you know. Um, Coming back to, to information, um, the Dallaire cable is not the first time the UN was aware that this was happening. You have a UN briefing in December in, 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 in cables that I've come across where they lay out for the diplomatic community the fact that arms are being passed out to militia that, uh, and that they have a plan for dealing with this. Um, and and they, they were aware of, the, of, of, of that aspect. But there was another side to that is also, the allegations are possibly true that arms were being passed out to Tutsi elements as well, that there was an infiltration of the RPF in the, in the various towns in, in Rwanda. So, uh, you, and, and that lists were being drawn up on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the RPF side as well as on the Hutu side. So you had these kind of counter allegations. And if you take a diplomatic stance where you say, okay, you both are right, let's look for the common ground. If you stick in that, then you, you've got these contrary things and you're not going to move forward. At, at some point in time, probably, we, we, we needed to have a, a, a more serious assessment of the evil that was lurking. Instead, uh, we, were, we were very much focused on getting the Russia peace process done. That was, that in, in a sense, that kind of captures the naivete thing. The whole focus was the peace process. The whole focus was getting the, the Russia institutions established. Um, and, and, the, and the reason for the UN response to Dallaire was we're just very, very, very close to having an agreement here, and if you, if you go out and do this preemptive kind of thing, then it may blow the whole, the whole you know, effort to establish the legitimate institutions that are going to carry the country forward. And so we were looking forward to a better day when right behind us, you know, all this all evil was lurking. Uh, if we could take maybe two more questions, uh, then I think uh, for the sake of class, we'll have yes, to sir. wrap up. At the beginning uh, of your talk, you apologized for not being a lawyer. So, um, you allowed me to apologize for not being a political scientist. You spoke about the doctrine of African states and African solutions that was adopted in, I think you said, 1960. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering why um, that doctrine was adopted, especially um, in a continent 
where there is uh, so much political strife in a number of different countries. I have a friend who works for the UN. When I told him, you know, about my being upset with the situation in Darfur, he said, you know, that's great, but you know, you can you can basically pick a country, and you're going to find some similar thing going on. <coughs> so why would you adopt a doctrine that, in some way, facilitates these types of things going on for one specific continent, and maybe not? other conflicts that are going on yeah. in the world? Uh, I think part of the answer goes back to a long history of U.S. non-involvement in Africa on a colonial basis. And if you look at humanitarian intervention, if you look at coercive humanitarian intervention, you're talking about colonialism, reestablishment of some kind of authority, international authority, over peoples who have not behaved in ways that the international community thinks is right. Um, so um, uh, there's a real reluctance on the part of the United States to to do anything in terms of kind of pressuring the, the political side in Africa um, uh, at the time of African independence. We wanted African states independent. We wanted them asserting themselves. We wanted them in the international arena. And until, really, until Bush the father, uh, uh, all kinds of things were happening in Africa politically, which the United States basically ignored. We were on a developmental kind of thing, and we, we were not particularly concerned with human rights and other kinds of things. Uh, Jimmy Carter began to turn that around, um, and, we, and we did finally accept the notion that you know, violation of human rights was not something that we could accept as American people. And, and uh, the elder Bush established democracy as the kind of thing that we really wanted to see happen, and that one party, one state kind of thing wasn't going to fly anymore. But um, that was a long time after this, this doctrine of let's let, let the Africans, you know, express themselves, do their own thing kind of thing. And uh, so that was deeply there. And, and then um, uh, you have to go back to the Congo experience in the early 60s where we find, found ourselves beginning to intervene and very found, found ourselves in very, very deep water very, very fast and found ourselves pushing this off on the UN as quickly as we could. Uh, I think the Kennedy, you find Kennedy making some very bold pronouncements about Africa, the, the bright new Africa and so forth, early on in his administration. And then after that, there's two or three years where you don't hear anything at all about Africa if you go through the records. And that's basically because we're caught in the, in the Congo mess. There's two things that have scored the American foreign policy conscience. One is the mess in the Congo in the early 60s, and two is the Somali battleship, what was the name of that, black ship? Black Hawk Down incident. And those two things are, are kind of in the back of every American's mind as we're talking about doing something in Africa. And, and the idea is, well, maybe Africans know better than we do and know how to operate better than we do. Maybe we ought to help them do it. Yes, sir. Yeah, but I see that um, the United States involvement in South Africa supporting apartheid, and in Nigeria, many dictatorships that went before the eyes of America because of the, you know, we have uh, uh, Exxon, Mobile, you know, we can cite King, uh, Ken Sarawiwa, the, you know, human rights activist who was killed and America knew about that. Mm -hmm. um, so is it more about economic interest instead of what happened in Somalia or what happened in 1960? Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't disagree with you at all that uh, our economic interests uh, in Africa uh, and our cultural interests in Africa probably are stronger than our, our, our political and our, our and certainly stronger than our security interests. And uh, we don't deploy forces unless we have security interests, or we shouldn't. But um, uh, in the case of Nigeria, we did use a, a good bit of that toolbox, including um, denial of visas and, 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 and non-recognition of regimes and so forth. Um, uh, in the case of South Africa, depending on the period of time, but uh, boycotts, uh, the U.S. boycott of South Africa on, on arms goes back much earlier than the U.N. boycott, for example. Uh, there's lots more that we could have done. But um, uh, again, I think that uh, you'll find that uh, U.S. policy essentially looks towards the OEU and towards African leadership for the solution of African problems. Thank you very, very much for your kind attention. It's been great being with you.